you know, also recorded. So uh, again, hello for everyone. Uh, we have we are returning the, this time to more uh, Zoom uh, style of uh, seminars after we had a few weeks of uh, seminars in uh, uh, of people coming here in the room and we'll have them to the end of the semester, I hope. Nothing will prevent, but uh, the advantage of that that we have this kind of uh, seminars that we can have uh, visitors from far away and uh, Professor Lee Nyatt will be the, our visitor today. And this also gives us, uh, so unfortunately she could not come to Israel yet. That was the, the original plan uh, a year ago. Or she, uh, that was the plan, but we had to change it. And we are hope, we're very happy that we have the opportunity to have you here only virtually, but it's perfect and not at all. Uh, just one announcement before that, two announcements before that, as you remember, next week is a vacation year, so we'll meet in two weeks. And I'm very happy to uh, congratulate our, yes, of course, and uh, to congratulate our uh, colleague, Amos Morris Wright, for getting his uh, full professor uh, this week, or uh, a professor in Aminyan, uh, Ivrit. So congratulations for Amos, and I hope we'll have uh, more uh, chances to congratulate all of you, all of you at camp in, uh, in, the, in the near future. So now uh, let me uh, introduce uh, shortly uh, Lynn uh, Neihardt. Uh, Lynn is a professor at the Department, the Department of History at the University of Wisconsin Medicine, where she, where she now is talking from uh, nearby for us, but depends on the, on the distance. And she studies the history of biology in the 19th century, and mainly in uh, Europe. She's, she's especially interested in the history of investigation into organization of living things, the social organization of sciences that, uh, that study them, and relations between elite and popular science, which we'll hear of it will be today. Her current research examines the history of ideas about biological individuality, parts and holes in 19th century Europe, and their relationship to broader cultural and political uh, movement. Their uh, latest book, More Than uh, Nature, The Rise of, uh, of Biological Perspective in Germany, uh, was published in the University of Chicago Press in 2009. As you uh, probably remember from the invitation, her talk will be on Matthias uh, Schleiden's theory of history, philosophy, po politics, and popular science. So, Lynn, please. Thank you so much. Um, I want to um, thank uh, Shaul and earlier Ori for inviting me and um, last year and again this year. So that's really kind of you. And to Adam for um, seeing to the technical details. I, I really appreciate it. I'm I sorry, I can't. Uh, yeah. One uh, reminds me that I should have said that uh, Lynch is a visitor for us and part of the Bar Ilel uh, series of lectures. Uh, which we organized together with the Edelstein Center in the, at the Hebrew University and the Van Leer Institute of Jerusalem. So, sorry for this interpretation. No, I, I, I get it, right. So I'm sorry I can't be seeing you all in person, uh, but I'm very glad to be able to share my work uh, with you. And I will say that I um, need to update my um, information because I have set aside uh, or put in the background a little bit more, my work on biological individuality um, to work on science and politics in the mid 19th century, a decision that I made um, after Trump was elected. And I thought that um, there needed to be more attention to uh, thinking about science and politics. So you'll see that this is part of, of what I'm working on today. Um, just a heads up, I, as a historian, I am used to um, reading my text, so I will be doing that. So if you see my eyes going somewhere else, then like right into the camera, that's why. And I am going to do go back and forth with screen sharing. I have a PowerPoint, but I don't use it all the time. So I'm going to share the screen now and um, 
get started, but I'll be coming out of it a couple times. And hopefully that will work. Yeah, it works. I'm just trying to get it up. It seems to be a little slow. Come on, there we go. Right, so I should have said all, all of the names of the institutes that were associated with the So my talk today is about Matthias Schleiden's theory of history. It's not exactly one of the things for which he is known. A botanist at the German University of Jena in the middle of the 19th century, Schleiden is best known today, especially among biologists, for being one half of the duo known for the schleiden schwann cell theory developed in the late 1830s, which argued that all organisms derive from individual cells. Along with Darwinian evolution, the cell theory was one of the most important unifying ideas in the 19th century in biology. So beyond this basic tag, historians of biology also know Schleiden for his 1842 Elements of Scientific Botany, which strove to set rigorous new inductive standards for the scientific study of plants. A few historians of philosophy have noted him as an ardent follower of the neo-Kantian Jakob Fries, while some historians of science and religion have remarked on his comments about materialism in the 1850s and 60s, contributions to the wider materialism debate that sprang up in the late 1850s, uh, sorry, across the 1850s. And occasionally his 1848 popular book, Die Pflanze und ihr Leben, in English titled The Plant, a Biography, gets a mention, in part because it was an important source of inspiration for Ernst Haeckel. People who talk about Die Pflanze always say, inspired Ernst Haeckel. Aimed at a general educated audience, it was a great success, running through six editions between 1848 and 1864, and gaining translated editions in England, the US, two different editions, the Netherlands and France, yet few scholars have paid close attention to. Fewer historians still have addressed Schleiden's more serious turn toward cultural history and commentary, which also dated to the 1850s. In this decade, Schleiden wrote numerous essays, often based on public lectures that were published in general interest periodicals for the educated public, such as the Deutsches Museum, the Allgemeine Zeitung, and Festermann's Monatshefte. Some of these essays were later collected into volumes or were takeoffs for longer works. In these, he covered topics as diverse as the building of the Suez Canal, the unity of humanity, and the materialism debate. These essays pointed toward the direction of his later career. For in 1862, he left his professorship at Jena and would work mainly as a public lecturer and popular writer about the cultural history of science for the rest of his life. Schleiden's biographers, Ilse Jan and Isolde Schmidt, contextualized this move largely in terms of, on the one hand, Schleiden's success as a lecturer, and on the other hand, his administrative overload as director of the Botanical Garden at Jena, which they say prevented him from doing much more scientific research. This interpretation presents the familiar case, I think, of a scientist who, having made his mark in detailed scientific research, wanted to do something different and bigger. So I'm just going to stop for a few paragraphs with the share screen. So all of this seems true enough, but I think the story is richer and more interesting. To begin with, Schleiden's interest in cultural history did not begin with his turning away from botany. There are already signs of it in his botany textbook of 1842 and his book, Die Pflanze. And it's crystallized in a little essay that he published in 1851 in the newly founded liberal periodical Deutsches Museum. As these works show, Schleiden justified his interests in both cultural history and writing for a broader public through a particular philosophy of history, which encapsulated his cultural politics while resting ultimately in his theological commitments. 
His theory of history thus ties together his philosophy of science, his approach to materialism, his views on popular science, and his political commitment to a centrist vision of cultural change that's been much neglected, I think, in the history of German science. My talk today is not 100% biographical, however. I also suggest at the very end that attending to Schleiden's theory of history might offer some new insight into broader visions of the relations of science to social progress in the 1840s and 50s, and maybe even today. So let me say a few words about these decades. In the history of German science, the 1840s and 50s form um, a critical period, although under-researched compared to the later 19th century. This was when the natural sciences began to break off from the larger world of academic scholarship um, to assert their unity as natural sciences as distinct from the humanities, the, the Geisteswissenschaft. But it was before the German university became the dominant scientific institution that it would become by the end of the, by the last third of the century. Let me return to sharing my screen. At mid-century two, sometimes this, this is just a little slow, sorry. Popular science began to take off, enabled by new publishing capabilities and markets, by contests among the scientifically educated over what sorts of knowledge would bring about popular enlightenment, or would it be popular impiety and degradation? More broadly, this was a time of political unrest, fueled by famine, desire for greater political representation, and the hope for unification of the many German states into a single Germany. This climaxed in the failed revolutions of 1848-49, which were then succeeded by a long decade of political repression. Today's talk is connected to my current book project, which seeks to describe and assess how a handful of leading German speaking life scientists in the 1840s and 50s chose to act in the face of the political crises of their time and how they found different ways to balance or join their identities as scientists and as citizens, a topic that I see as particularly resonant today. I interpret Schleiden's long career of popular writing in part as a form of political expression centered on public enlightenment, a mode of action in which he found success when his efforts at more direct particip political participation as a parliamentarian in 1848 and 49 fizzled out. So in the rest of this talk, I will first uh, sketch out the history, of history as it evolved to up through 1851. I'll then discuss how it sheds new light on his bibliography, sorry, his biography in the late 18, later 1850s and 60s, and then finally offer some brief comments about what this story means to our broader self-conception of the scientists and the relations between science and society um, in that period in the Schleiden's textbook of botany, De Grundsüge, opened with a brief historical overview of his subject. Here he links the history of botany to the history of humanity more generally. The latter expressed itself through three levels of, develop of knowledge development. First came the knowledge needed for basic survival. These basics satisfied the second level of knowledge involved the effort to identify and order the things in the world, a practice that you would elsewhere characterize as associated with curiosity. The third level involved the effort to discover the internal lawful connections among all things and thus the rise to Wissenschaft. The history of botany he wrote in the same book. Yep. One moment there is some uh, noise. I'm not sure if it's from you or from others. I un unmute everyone and then unmute yourself. Okay. Just... <laughs> 
Sorry, it might have to do with my moving my pages. Um, I'm just trying to both see my screen and my text. Okay, now, now unmute yourself. Sorry, I just had to find the when the screen and share the place for me to unmute myself disappeared and um, I got it now. So Okay. Yeah, so we can. Uh, yeah. Are we good? Okay, now it's fine. Okay, good. Yeah, another, probably, it's, it's probably something with your microphone. So you should put it. Yeah. Put it. Oh, I don't think it. Yeah. Hmm. Well, okay. I'll. I don't know. Um, I'll let me know if it's if it's too shuffly. Um, so for Schleiden, uh, the history of botany can be understood within this larger framework about the history of humanity. Uh, though the earlier characteristic approaches to knowledge persisted even as newer approaches appeared. So the first period extending from the beginnings of learning to the late middle ages were characterized for the search for useful plants connected to survival as seen in Materia Medica and herbals. The second period was that of description and classification culminating in the work of Linnaeus. And the third period, that of so-called scientific botany had barely begun. Left unstated there, but evident through the rest of his textbook's famous methodological introduction is that this last period was the period of strictly inductive work that he himself, Schleiden, was instrumental in moving along with the very textbook that its readers were then reading. Indeed, we can see here the appropriation of history to bolster a claim of scientific progress that would lead to just the kind of science he was advocating himself. It's also worth noting here that in advocating this inductive method, Schleiden's textbook was in fact a leading light in a broader trend to move botany forward by establishing methodological rules for the life sciences that would raise them from being so-called descriptive sciences and um, setting them apart from other forms of knowledge such as philosophy, especially philosophy, and connect them to the other so-called exact sciences. Schleiden's chapter on the history of vegetable, uh, the history of the vegetable world in his popular book, Die Pflanze, presents a still broader view. Here he panned out from the history of botanical knowledge to the cultural uses of plants across history. He argued that plants existed for human, again, at three levels. The first level, once again, was to furnish humans with nutrition. And he described this again as the lowest purpose because it was an animal requirement that satisfies only individual humans. The second loftier purpose concerns the vegetable world as a whole and its significance and its significance for the regulation of the numerous and comprehensive physical processes of the earth, as he put it, its role in shaping climate and the lives of man in the mass, so a collective picture of human life. The third highest level is without question, the noblest and most exalted. This is to understand that plants like understand plants like all nature as the symbol of the eternal. Behind this play of dead natural forces and their products, he says, we adore a holy author and sustainer. Thus, the study of plants, when it attends to, as he calls it, the beauty and sublimity of forms, constitutes the worship. End quote. The symbolic uses of plants, he wrote in the final essay in this book, were significantly universal across cultures. So if you could uh, a little bit like explain how the context of this uh, kind of the theory of history and 
which and now the connection between this is the theory of history and the theory of plants coming to the history in the sense of the, the, the human history food plants. Well, so this is what's kind of interesting to me is that I see this as a, um, this is an inter intervention by Schleiden as a scientist into cultural history. So there were a lot of stage uh, theories of history in uh, the late 18th and early 19th century, um, especially among, other, among followers of Kant's anthropology who, so they strove to write cultural histories or universal histories of the development of humanity. Um, and I think Schleiden's intervention here is um, to bring in his authority as a life scientist into this and, and say that life scientists also have an important contribution to uh, the history of culture. I wanna say just one more word about this these stage theories because um, Johann Christian August Grohmann, who is a pretty obscure guy, um, but uh, I mentioned him because he taught logic, metaphysics, aesthetics, and philosophy of history at the Hamburg Academic Gymnasium, which Schleiden attended in the early 1820s. And Grohmann had written earlier in 1809, a book that divided the history of culture into three phases. Um, and characterized first uh, the first phase as by characterized by a nomadic individualized existence completely dependent on nature, then the partial domination of nature with settled society, agriculture, and trade, and finally the period of what he called unrestrained freedom, where uh, scientists sought to gain, uh, not scientists, humans sought to gain control over themselves morally and ethically through the use of intellectual and philosophical reason. And this phase, Grohmann wrote, was marked historically by the rise of Christianity. So did Schleiden know of Grohmann's work? I even had a little trouble making sure that Grohmann was actually teaching there then um, because of the obscurity of the sources, but I believe he was. Um, had he taken a class from him? I'm not sure. Um, but I'm not sure it's really necessary for us to make that particular link, although I think it's interesting because these phases um, were already familiar at the beginning of the 19th century, even though they would only gain their most famous, I think, formulation in the work almost a century later, the end of the 19th century by uh, Lewis Henry Morgan, who, so called, who since then gets credit for the establishment of the phases of savagery, barbarism, and civilization. But it's all over the place in the early 19th century. Just a few years later, in a different popular context, Schleiden would move beyond the history of plants to discuss his ideas about cultural history more generally. In 1851, he wrote an essay entitled On the Popular Treatment of the Natural Sciences, published in the first year of the liberal periodical Deutsches Museum. And I, I showed you a quick slide of the beginning of that essay uh, earlier. In this essay, Schleiden outlined and elaborated on his theory of cultural development by way of explaining the then current boom in popular science writing, especially in natural history. Now, Schleiden could have pointed to some immediate reasons for this boom. For instance, he might have looked at the context, to the context of efforts to expand voting rights, one goal of the movement that culminated in the revolutions of 1848. This justification, which some people did make, would have connected the prospective extension of suffrage with the need for greater cultural literacy especially in science, which increasingly, it was argued by some, would shape their lives. Um, I think he was interested in the rise in popular science um, because, well, not only was he doing it, that's part of it, but buried deep in this article um, is it maybe an important fact, which is that it included a review of a recent book on popular natural history, namely Karl Fuchs' German translation of the infamous British vestiges of the natural history of creation. 
But Schleiden sets this within the larger context of the importance of popular science writing with its aims and, and dangers. And he didn't, in fact, here make an argument about suffrage. Did you want to say anything? I, no. I, uh, okay, I, your screen just switched. With the, with my, with our, yeah. uh, that's, uh, no, but that's, uh, please continue. Okay. Um, so in this article, Schleiden argues that one shouldn't look to present day circumstances for an explanation for this popular science boom, nor even the recent past. One has to take the long view. And here he stepped back to present in some more detail than before his own view of the history of thought. Human history, Schleiden said, was not simply a development. It represented a moral task to be undertaken by humanity, the task of progressive enlightenment, of human education toward, as he put it, God, immortality, and virtue. I had to practice that so I didn't say immorality. Uh, so immortality, important difference there. Uh, in this sense, again, he shared older ideas of cultural history that went back to the late 18th century. So he described how this moral development took place in two main ways. One considered the relationships between scientific and religious truth, and the other focused on the relations between great minds and the masses. So the first of these, the relation between scientific and religious truth ties in with the stage theories elaborated in his earlier works. Here again, Schleiden emphasized the movement from physical to spiritual, but now in a broader cultural way. He presented the history of humanity as involving the gradual differentiation and clarification of the religious and scientific approaches into two different realms. Following a standard view in the history of mythology, he wrote that the ancient pagans had physical myths, myths that explain natural phenomena in terms of gods and spirits. This gave way to the ethical myths emerging from, Jew from Jewish monotheism and then the rise of Christianity. Associated with the increasing autonomy of science from metaphysical questions, these religions themselves turned away from physical explanation to represent humanity's religious task as moral and ethical. So you have separation of spheres between the moral and ethical worlds of religion and explaining the physical world, which is the job of natural science. And it's here in his focus on the history of rational thought, I think, that Schleiden's work becomes less derivative from older science students of universal cultural history and the history of religion. The increasing autonomy of natural science through the Middle Ages, he wrote, culminated in Newton's natural philosophy, the first expression of an autonomous and consequential scientific method that generated internally consistent truths. This was also a necessary step, he writes, in the development toward the highest goals of humanity. But why, what did Newton and Newtonian science have to do with cultural history? This is where the other side of Schleiden's history, theory of history comes in. Schleiden advocated a distinctive great man theory of history. Great minds, or as he also put it, leading personalities, among whom he singled out Christ, Newton, and more recently Kant, had ideas that would be world-changing, but were quite literally ahead of their time. For their ideas to become fully realized, they needed to take up, be taken up by the masses, and this was necessarily a protracted process. And I think I'm going to go back to my screen share here. Give me a minute for it to catch up. So I love this quote, he says, so this is a totally anachronistic picture, but I couldn't resist it. Um, so this is what he says, humanity is a massive interconnected gear work. Before the impetus coming from the spring, a great human mind sets the last great wheel in motion, many centuries must pass. This is in part because the masses themselves are conservative, 
in part because church and state, the most powerful institutions in society, are themselves uh, have tended to be dogmatic and oppressive, and to oppose the central scientific principle, as Schleiden thought it, of unvarying progress. Uh, sorry, and how, how much was this kind of a great man, great man idea distinctive or different from, from other, other views at the time? So there were two main views. Uh, cultural historians of the 18th century and early 19th century following Herder de-emphasized leading individuals, typically kings and generals, in favor of understanding the mind of das Volk, the people, whether that be interpreted as humanity overall or more likely a particular um, nation, ethnic group, or race. But Schleiden certainly had people he could draw on for his great man view. The poet scientist and German national idol Goethe, for example, thought that science, society progressed only through the actions of leading personalities. Among those closer to Schleiden's own generation, the Englishman Thomas Carlyle published his influential work on heroes, hero worship, and the heroic in history in 1840, which is often credited as being like the leading great man theory. Um, and he has like, like he gives examples of a few great men in different aspects of culture of you know, poet, great poets, great military leaders, um, great philosophers. He doesn't say anything about great scientists though. Schleiden could have read um, Carlyle on heroes. He read English well. He even worked for a while translating works from English into German um, to try to make a living that didn't work very well. Uh, but probably his most obvious model would have been Hegel, a leading proponent of the world historical personality. So for Hegel, such great military leaders as Alexander the Great, Caesar, and Napoleon were his models for those who changed the world through their actualization of the human spirit. Now, Schleiden doesn't directly mention Hegel, but he certainly was aware of him. In several earlier writings, Schleiden had attacked Hegel's idealist views uh, viciously and repeatedly. Hegel was an enemy of Fries, uh, Schleiden's uh, beloved mentor. Um, and particularly, he detested Hegel for, uh, Schleiden detested Hegel for spe spreading a scandalously bad understanding of science that ignored the real world. And in this work, Schleiden does say that if one organized one's history solely according to its leading personalities, one would have only, as he put it, quote, an ideal history of mankind rather than a real history, which has to involve the masses. The people, das Volk, were necessary to producing a real history. And so the key to connecting the great minds to the people and thereby moving cultural history forward was the gear work. And the gear work, it appears, involves something else as well, an active role for scientists in carrying the messages and knowledge of science to the people. And here Schleiden goes into more detail. He writes, the number of educated people is insignificant in comparison to the whole of human culture. This group, the educated people matter only, quote, to the extent that it mediates the link between the great leading minds and the masses who are to be moved. Therefore, the highest task of what we might call the normal learned person, so not a world-changing thought leader, is to bring the word of the greats to the masses. But how should this best be done? What's the path to this highest spiritual enlightenment of the masses? Abstractions like God and virtue are philosophical and hard to grasp. The way to bring these ideas to the mind of the masses is to connect them to that which is certain, and the realm of the certain is the physical world of the natural sciences. As Schleiden wrote, for man, nothing is of more immediate and greater certainty than the physical nature surrounding him and the mathematical forms governing this nature. To get to the philosophical truth then, one must go through natural science. This science, for the 
was by definition the study of material physical nature. And as he put it, the path leads through night to the light, through the most real and most perfect materialism to the highest spiritual goods. Here then is a justification for popularization by a scientist. So I'm gonna, I have a, a bunch to say that, although we could still look at the gear work, the gear work is pretty beautiful. Um, so maybe I'll just leave that up there. Schleiden also cautioned that non-experts should not be trusted with popularization, for they're more likely to get it wrong. You know what, I have a lot to say here without, I don't want you reading one text and listening to something else, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. Um, Non-experts might also be short-sighted about the moral lessons to be drawn from the history of science. In fact, short-sightedness was a perspective problem that appeared in various different guises. Materialists were short-sighted because they viewed materialist explanations as the final answer, whereas Schleiden insisted that materialism was just a necessary way station to true spiritual enlightenment. Laymen could be short-sighted too. And when popularizers presented a scientifically controversial theory before the general public, such as the historical development of life uh, across Earth history, whether through revolutions or through continuous development, the subject of the book that's, whose review is buried in this essay, when, when popularizers present controversies like this, they run a risk. The assertion or the presentation of opposing views among scientists could send a message to non-scientists that the scientists didn't know what they were talking about, that their theoretical differences were mere differences of opinion or egoistic posturing by overly learned men. And this was not good for science. The trouble with science, Schleiden wrote, was that controversies were necessary to probing the logic and evidence underlying the differences in theories. And it takes a long time to churn through this process to achieve the consensus that corresponds to the truth. You need to take the long view, he says, and to teach it too. And only the scientifically trained should be trusted with this task. So to sum up, Schleiden saw history as a necessary and necessarily protracted history of progress towards spiritual enlightenment that moved via the differentiation of science from religion and that diffused from the great minds through the lesser scientific minds to the masses. But that, that process was uneven, fraught with pitfalls and reverses. And that's one reason why it takes so long. Um, we can connect that now with this kind of a view of history to his own path towards popularization that you started with your talk. Sure, thank you. Um, so I think that um, at the biographical level, um, I want to argue that attending to Schleiden's theory of history really helps us make, um, understand the path that he, he took later on, especially his turn toward popular writing. So we can see him not just as a scientist who had tired of his research thing and then gone off to do something less productive, but rather as someone deeply motivated by his vision of the nature of history and his own place in it to help carry out that history, to bring the message of rational material science to the world. And the further message that this was but a step on the way to higher realms of virtue and religious piety. I also want to suggest that this was partly a political move, a way of expressing his deepest convictions about the possibilities for gradual social and cultural change, his opposition to radicalism and to revolution, and what we might call his conservative liberalism um, in a more productive way than continue on as an active scientist. So I want to just give two examples of how we might um, interpret Schleiden's later writings in light of this picture of history. First is his work on materialism. We've just seen that in his 1851 essay, he pointed out 
that materialism is a necessary critical stance for science in the present, not the final end state as philosophical materialists uh, mistakenly believe. He addressed materialism again in another popular essay in 1857 and in a yet longer essay in 1863. So the 1857 essay came in the wake of the so-called materialism debate between two physiologists, the radical materialist Karl Folk, the same guy who had done the translation of vestiges into German, and the conservative Christian Rudolf Wagner. Their enmity had been building since the late 1840s, but boiled over into a pamphlet war in 1854 and 55, which pulled in a number of others over the next few years, and Schleiden was one of them. In his 1857 article, Schleiden asserted that only a fool would argue that the soul, de Seele, doesn't exist, thereby opposing Foch. And then he defined the soul as, quote, the entire complex of all those phenomena that we decide describe as our psychic life, our Seelenleben. So not necessarily anything to do with Wagner's Christian soul. The real question for Schleiden was something that the debaters had bypassed. Not whether this existed or not, but as what? As an independent entity, as a substance, or merely as a property of another substance, that's the Seelenleben, uh, is it a property of something else? In which last case, the question was, what is the carrier of this property? So um, he wanted to, to push that to the orthodox, the post-Newtonian scientific orthodoxy of sticking to the investigation of space, matter, and motion. Anything beyond that, Schleiden said, was not the business of the natural science. And so scientists, and so the materialism, materialism can't be either proven or disproven on scientific grounds. It is a philosophical question, he says. And he says, the scientist who imagines his world to be the whole world is as laughable as the bookbinder who would maintain that the spiritual development of man should be credited to him. So take that scientist. Um, it's not the progress of natural sciences that's responsible for, ma for materialism, as many anti-scientific people would say, but the decline of philosophy that is to blame. And again, he points his finger at Hegel, in his view, the cause of a major reversal in Germany's philosophical fortunes. Schleiden would flesh these thoughts out still further in his major essay on materialism in 1863. By this time, he was far less tolerant of materialism than he'd been six years earlier. And here we see again a further elaboration of his intertwined philosophy of history, history of philosophy, and theory of diffusion. In the course of a lengthy and often circuitous discussion of materialism, he explains that whereas Newton had prospected the study of nature external to us, Kant had applied Newton's method and adapted it to the study of our internal nature through his own critical method. Kant had hoped that his method would bring us to an understanding of, as Schleiden put it, soul, freedom, God. But, and here's where the diffusion comes in, as Schleiden wrote, even Kant, quote, was not in a position to accomplish more than a single person can do. Kant's work was just a start to be taken up correctly by his true disciple, Jakob Fries, as opposed to all those other wrong guys, and rounded out in its details by Ernst Friedrich Oppelt. Reading this in the context of his previous writings on diffusion allows us to see the larger movement of the gear work in action from Kant to Fries to Oppelt. And one has to say, it seems implicit that this philosophy would be further elaborated on by Schleiden himself through his own writings in clarifying clarifying and diffusing the Kant free school of ideas in popular venues. So I think we can here see Schleiden instantiating his own theory of history as diffusion with respect to the philosophy of science as well. So I think my time is running a little bit short. So I'm going to skip the, um, the little short thing I had about some of his popular writings and I'm gonna, share my screen again 
So that was what I was going to talk about. I just want you to notice the words symbolism in there with two of his later works. Uh, remember, that's the highest stage of uh, cultural enlightenment that he wants to talk about. Finally, so stepping back, we can situate Schleiden's, the story of Schleiden's commitment and career in relation to the scientist's role in society as it was changing in the mid 19th century. As popular science writing flooded the book and magazine markets in the later 1840s and 50s, Schleiden's stance on its value was a distinctly liberal uh, but top down one. Scientists, the best scientists, he argued, had a duty to devote themselves to explaining science, not just the information of science, but how science works to the broader public. His broader public was an already well-educated public, but educating them was a step on the way to moving the great gears that would eventually move the masses to a more rational worldview. Schleiden's stance, I think, reflects a new sense of cultural and social power and responsibility emerging in the natural sciences at mid 19th century. As he wrote in June 1949, just as the revolution was failing, to his fellow scientist, Rudolf Wagner, yes, the anti materialist, but before the materialism debate heated up, he wrote, We are the steadfast pillars of intellectual life. The natural sciences will survive any revolution untouched because they are supported by the most compelling national interests. No people under any political or social form of life can do without them, that is scientists, if it is not to starve. And I'm so I'm proud enough to assert ours is the future. From us comes the salvation from the most threatening danger. Here we see, I think, the ideology of modern science in all its optimism, its future orientation, its claim to both instrumental and cultural power, and also its independence from particular political regimes. But at the same time, it was a matter of ensuring and expanding support for his view, and that could only be done by proselytizing, by persuading the broader educated public that science was the basis of future cultural, social, and even spiritual progress. So I see Schleiden's concern with popularization here as part of the assertion of the scientists' high cultural position at a moment of ascent, but also a great challenge. In this respect, it's worth underlining that for Schleiden, the history of science has a key place in cultural history because science is for him the cultural location that most fully combines rationality with a commitment to progressive but non-revolutionary change. Scientific knowledge, in his view, always builds on what came before and always must move forward. Um, although institutions like church and state can try to suppress it, science is and must be the most, to the leading location for positive change because scientists know that knowledge must change, that dogma cannot suppress truth. This would become one of the standard lines about science's place in society, one that gives body to a somewhat self-aggrandizing image of the scientist as perhaps the culturally progressive social figure who mysteriously manages to be that without actually participating in politics. By standing above the fray, working toward truth and disseminating it, one can bring progress to the world without actually engaging in the messy business of worldly politics. In the 1850s, when the scientific materialists were being denied university positions or were being kicked out of the ones they had, Schleiden's position offered a safer conservative path to progress. If that path sounds familiar, I would argue that essential parts of it continue to be visible all around us, sustaining an ideal of progress through science that remains deeply appealing to scientists however much harder it is to sustain today as uh, pure and distinct from politics. This image forged and tempered in the 1840s and 50s in a particular historical context involving philosophical conflict between idealism and materialism, political crisis and an emergent faith in the power of science has proven remarkably durable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh,
for this uh, interesting talk. And now I'm, uh, the floor is open to the public to uh, give us uh, some uh, more uh, questions, remarks. This is Snake. Oh, you're uh, you're muted. <laughs> I'm glad we we both have that issue. <laughs> Thank you for a really enlightening talk. And I, I when I was listening to you, I was trying to remember when was Comte Auguste Comte. When was it translated into German, or in what ways his ideas were disseminated? Because he had German disciples. They, some of the New Hegelians were among his disciples in one way or another and Gustav Dalkertal and other people. And so I, I was wondering, because there is a certain similarity, which is very striking, not just the three stages, but the role of the scientists, the importance of disseminating science, the importance of methodology, a lot of things. And so it, it, it was sort of... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, since um, this first, the first uh, talk with the great gear works that I mentioned was 1851, which is when um, Comte's, uh, huh, now I'm trying to remember which one is published then in English. Oh, in um, English, I, earlier, in, in I mean, English. in French, sorry, in French. Uh, so, so in, so, you know, he has different, uh, different things he published in different periods yes. and so, so this is already the the positivist church when right he, when he already has this list of church uh, saints which are musicians and scientists and and great art authors and so on yeah you know it's funny when i've read about Comte's positivism it was in connection with uh, something slightly different uh, which is um, the idea of um, realpolitik and where that comes in and whether the German who, uh, there's been arguments that, the, that the, the German guy who developed this idea, uh, whose name is me read it the second, um, he was, he had read Comte, but the broader um, reception of Comte in Germany uh, seems to come later, like in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. But you know, <laughs> This is the thing, is that these guys, I mean, Schleiden also read French and um, didn't keep a record of what he wrote about, uh, what he read. And I mean, like Darwin is very helpful in that respect because he always had his list of readings, right? Most people don't keep a list of who they read. And they don't and so, quote, and they don't even- And they don't, and they don't cite or quote. So like no mention of Hegel, yeah. but when, when he says, when um, Schleiden says, you know, it's merely an ideal picture of history in context that would seem like it would be anti hegel yeah, yeah, but good point about about clumped um, because I would, I should keep looking. Um, when I looked up, I've even tried to find Comte's name in using like Google engrams and Google books as a search. Um, but of course it's hard because Comte also means count. And so that comes up with a lot of other names. Um, but, but it's, it's not very findable in, in texts from the period in German. Yeah. I will continue to look though. Thank you. Thanks. I'll give some people some more time to ask questions. And, and, and in the meantime, I'll, I'll ask uh, one or two. But that's something. Uh, perhaps it'll be speculative that uh, you, you gave us a talk about the, uh, the career or the, the, of the Schleiden's career as a popular writer, or some or re reasons for the reasons that he moved to, to be a popular writer and his own justification for that. And of course, we are usually interested in Schleiden, as you said in the beginning, because of its work on cell theory or in general on uh, botany and not only. 
in, in more general, where we say a sense that its contribution is usually regarded as more, signif more significant. And I'd say, what, do you see any kind of connection between the two? So is there any kind of thing that, uh, because if for that, uh, there, is there any kind of similar way of the way he thinks he thought about science as to the, his own way in science or the way, uh, or, or there's some kind of other similarities, structural or others, or, or, or even casual connections between, between the two. Uh, yeah. So, so I think the most important thing is um, his notion of continuity. Um, I think that that go that what in his developmentalism in in botany, it's really important for him. You know, if you think about the cell theory, what does that say? It says that a, a mature plant derives from the continuous development and splitting of cells and their organization into uh, and growth into a larger complex whole. And so. Um, his notion of continuity in history um, is, is also connected to that. And in fact, um, there's a historian named Ulrich Sharpa who, who a long time ago wrote a lot, a, a fair amount about, about uh, Schleiden and his philosophy, which frankly, I find Schleiden's works on uh, philosophy really hard to wade through. I, I, I'm a historian, not a philosopher, but I keep getting drawn to philosophy. Um, but this continuity point, um, the con continuous development point is something that Sharpa uh, points to. And in, in fact, <laughs> connects it to some of Schleiden's late work, which I didn't mention, which is um, in eight, the later 1870s, he writes some pamphlets that gain a lot of fame for defending the Jews in Germany and Jewish culture. And Sharpa's essay, actually connects this very different uh, um, defense of, of Jews and Judaism to um, his, his developmentalism in part because the Jews are the basis of Christian monotheism, right? And so, so this continuity of rising is, is uh, important to him. Also, um, the other, I think, I think Sharpa may say this also, um, but in another connection where I mentioned that for, um, the, sorry, I want to get the quote right, um, where the contemplation of nature is the worship, like, um, that, that, I think Sharpa also connects to, um, I'm trying to remember how he connects it to Judaism. But, um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. I guess the, the other place where I see continuity, in fact, is, is in, in his evolutionary ideas. And Schleiden is known as an early defender of Darwin, but before Darwin, in fact, before the translation of Vestiges came out in the publication of Die Pflanze, he has a really interesting lecture um, where he shows himself to be a, um, a continuity guy. He doesn't believe in um, the revolutions of the earth that Cuvier had, had um, posited or the idea that, that Animal, that the, the living world is replaced with a, each new geological revolution. Rather, he believed in Lyellian continuity, Lyellian gradualism, and um, in the, the continuity of life uh, developing as a whole um, across, across time. So again, his, his commitment to gradualism seems, and to continuity seems to be in all realms. Uh, oh my goodness, an actual person in the room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks for the wonderful talk.
my question is about actually if you look there oh, <laughs> <laughs> your attention uh, now you're looking at my my back i'm looking um, at the back of your head yeah yeah um, just so, face the screen right <laughs> my question is uh, how would you place uh Schneiden's views about uh progressivism about uh, humanity uh progressing uh, in its relation to science uh in historical context. So we have the Enlightenment views, uh, which appear to want to mimic the success of natural science in other areas. And you have uh, Kant's views about how we should free ourselves from mythical and metaphysical systems. How, how do you place uh, Schleiden's views about progress in relation to the historical context? Huh. Well, this is the great problem that I'm trying to, to work out still. Um, because again, uh, as in my answer to Snake, um, he doesn't, he's not very, he's, he's clearer on who his, his enemies are um, uh, than anything else. And it's probably relevant that he was trained first as a lawyer before he, he um, turned to botany. Um, and, and so his arguments are all, all like he is always um, arguing for um, his position and everybody else is wrong. That's not quite the question that you asked. Um, you know, part of the trouble of situating him there is that there has been no work done really on his reception. Um, and so he is, he was considered up through the 19th century as one of the uh, classic writers, popular writers in science. And that's a reputation that went away. Um, and so um, I've worked more on thinking about his relation to other popularizers and the question of who should popularize? Because most of the popularizers in, in Germany and elsewhere were not scientists. And he is defending the role of the scientist and the need for the scientist to popularize. But, but I've only more recently been trying to resolve the question of, of where Schleiden sits in relation to history and history writing, because and that's a little separate from <laughs> the history of science, right? And so even just figuring him out in relation to German cultural history is, is um, kind of, of uh, tricky because it's a whole other area to learn than history of biology. But because most cultural historians in the 19th century before the new cultural history of the end of the 19th century were considered amateurs by professional historians. Well, or there's a divide, but most of the people who, who do kind of this broader cultural history um, were not considered professional historians. This is also that <clears throat> something that changes through the 19th century. And one of the things that I'm kind of working on reading a lot about right now is the idea of the political professor, uh, where in history among historians, there was this, Idea, this controversy between whether you should be Wissenschaftlich and above history, above politics, or um, a very popular way of being historian in the, from the 1830s through the 1860s is where you make your politics an integral part of your doing of history and vice versa. So there were a lot of parliamentarians in the National Assembly that um, sought to create a new constitution for Germany in 1848, 1849, who were historians. There are almost none who were scientists. And I, and I think that a reason for that is because of this different stance toward um, how you get to truth and how you have to keep truth 
clean of politics. I mean, it's a much more active debate among the historians than among the scientists in general. And so one of the reasons I find Schleiden interesting in this regard is because he seems to be trying to have it both ways. Um, again, I don't, when I think of the history of the history of science in, as it was being written in the mid 19th century, other than Quant and Huell, uh, it, you know, both writing a little, especially Huell a little earlier. Um, I think of this kind of, what, what emerges in the middle of the 19th century is kind of this listing of um, academics and their great ideas. So uh, Julius Sachs writing in the 1860s um, in his history of botany is this um, self-interested history of botany that shows how botany is getting better and better as long as they're doing more experiment. Um, and, and he puts down and, and diminishes, you know, anybody who is more philosophical. Um, but it's still a kind of a listing of not very always great men in science. It's, it's more of this kind of professional genealogy. And that's, so that's a kind of, I think, an emerging different kind of history of science as well. Sorry, that was a very long answer that didn't probably quite get at your question. But that's where I am on this. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, so maybe it's a bit unfair, but I wonder if I could uh, push you to reflect based on this project about the effect of uh, Trump on the philosophy of science or the eventual effect. Uh, such as it is or going to be. <laughs> well, since I already mentioned him. Exactly. You opened the door. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. So what, what turned me to this project, which was kind of a back burner project, I was doing a project on the on ideas about biological individuality in the 19th century. And I was interested, especially in their relation to um, concepts of parts and holds in building uh, the German nation. Um, and so I was, it was a very kind of uh, a focus on language and how parts and holes were modeled. And then after Trump was elected, um, in January, I had to give a title for a talk that I was going to do uh, for, you know, a little conference. And I thought, I just can't do this anymore. I, I have to do something that is more directly engaged with this question of science and truth, because what was happening right then was the organization of the March for Science. And, and this... Um, this quite, one of the interesting things that I read in early 2017 was an editorial, I think it was in the Washington Post, that said, uh, that cautioned the organizers of the March for Science for being too political by marching to defend the truth value of science. And I thought, well, isn't this ironic? Um, that, I mean, of course, and also they were, they were marching for funding, right? Don't cut science. And of course, later it got even worse with the suppression of anything that Trump didn't like about climate change or later COVID, you know. Um, so, so is that philosophy of science or is that politics of science? I see it in terms of politics, but I also think, you know, when I've given, I've talked about um, the defense of science in 1848 and now, a few times. And one of the things that I realized is that the position is really different because in 1848, it wasn't a defense of science. Science was like on this upswing. There wasn't a giant infrastructure already there. It's like this, it's this, it's this kind of progressive move gaining, seeking to gain greater social and cultural um, relevance and power. And in 
the last few years, um, I think part of the issue has been we can't stop acknowledging that science has a politics and how do we manage that? And I don't know how philosophers manage it. I was in a discussion in an interdisciplinary group of scholars a couple of years ago where um, one of my colleagues there said, um, well, I think you just have to own it that it's po political, that truth is political and, um, and just go from there. And I was like, yeah, but then is it truth? You know, you guys, you got some philosophers there. You guys tell me, what do you think? I'm serious. This is not a rhetorical. I, I, I want to throw it out to you there. Ehud, you're, you're um, uh, uh, muted again. Yeah, I think Shaul muted me, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think one thing, if we, if we look at it more uh, from a, Historian's perspective, I think what you can say is that this, these issues become inescapable, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, uh, it's it's not that I don't have views or can try to articulate them, uh, but but I think in terms of of the history of the philosophy of science, I think that for a long while, um, philosophy of science tried to black box these issues. I think this also was, of course, a response to a particular historical context, right? Um, but the box will not remain closed. So, so <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, I, I think these issues become more and more uh, prevalent in discussions within philosophy. I, I, I still, there is still a heterogeneity, I think, right? So not everybody is willing to go that far. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I think in, in this respect, you would, my prediction would be that uh, Trump is here to stay for a while, right, within the academic discussions of what science is all about and so on, in a sort of roundabout way. Can, can I add something? I think this is where you can really see the difference between philosophers of science and sociologists of science, because sociologists of science had no doubt whatsoever that you can talk about science, particularly about scientific communities, without talking about the political and social context in which they were active. And so the, the issue of the status of truth in any way, particularly scientific truth, particularly within special sciences, what kind of truth at what time under what circumstances always came up while the philosophers pushed it aside. And I think it, in some ways, historically, it harks back also to the issue of progress. Because, because uh, adopting progress is adopting a political stance. Even, even if you are a conservative liberal, adopting progress is, is the main movement of history and the main thrust of science is a political stance that by itself brings you to, to, uh, to articulate positions on Social, on the social and the political and science within the social and the political. Otherwise, you can't explain how progress survives or whether it should survive. Well, it, yeah. Um. So in, in a sense, if your character is for progress, he, he couldn't avoid also being implicated in this. And, and if he... And if in one way or another he knew Alexander von Humboldt's work, then indeed he would know it because Alexander von Humboldt was deeply implicated in the politics of French Revolution and the decades after. And so, and the issue of progress and continuity and revolution always came up in his work. So, that was yeah, that's interesting. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I'm still trying to, I, I, I'm struck by in the contemporary conversation, um, I have less occasion to talk to philosophers than um, historians and sociologists, but I, um, I a, a few years ago, I would, so I was at the, our Institute for Research in the Humanities for four years. Um, and that's an interdisciplinary group in the humanities. And at a year end, roundtable panel 
I, I, I made some statement at the beginning that was like something like, um, well, we all know that I mean, we've long since, tr uh, humanists have long since tossed out the concept of, of truth. And from the back of the room, my colleague and friend, Steve Nadler, who is a, is a historian of philosophy, said, well, does that cast me out of the humanities because I still believe in truth? And I'm like, Steve, really? Like, what? Wait a minute. And then, of course, the thing is that right now we're in a moment where um, scientists and maybe historians of science are anxious about defending truth because there's facts. I mean, we, we're, none of us is in favor of, you know, alternative facts. Um, that 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 um, so so that that question of how we talk about truth and how we talk about facts is like how do you do that in a way that does justice to the complexity of it or the human centered nature of our ideas of truth and yet doesn't concede that um, <laughs> that falsehoods exist. <laughs> <laughs> or don't, you know, I mean, that, that, that any truth is as good as any other truth. Um, I mean, that really bothers me. And I mean, and it's all, it's, it's a longstanding issue in history because people say, well, you have your history and I have my history and like, aren't they equally good? It's all interpretation. I mean, we have to kind of be better than that very um, shallow picture. And I just want to say one other thing about philosophy uh, of science, which is that, um, you know, the American tradition, as I know it and experience it on my campus at Wisconsin and um, see looking around in not very much, but here and there, is that we're still really dominated by a kind of analytic philosophy that does keep those hold up those boundaries uh, pretty clearly and does not want to get into the other stuff. So, I mean, what I think of as kind of a more continental approach to history and philosophy of science, which is a little more flexible and um, uh, maybe relativist, is um, not so much in evidence in the among the, the philosophers of science that I might have more contact. So I'd like to hear more of this other kind or other kinds, plural. Some more comments? If not, I would allow myself another one. Um, so I'll connect the things and try to, to, to return to the mid 19th century. Okay. Uh, and this, because one of the things is that we, we talk about progress and it's also connected to, to Oris talk and you, you mentioned that the, we know, and you mentioned also in your talk, the connection between progress as scientific progress is not taught, is not general, it's not necessarily political progress and material progress, which is also not necessarily scientific one, they are connected and they're also not necessarily political. But I guess all scientists believe in some way or another since the 17th century in scientific progress, okay, or since the late 17th century. And so, and, and it's very clear that this is the case with China. Uh, but it connects that also with some kind of ethical process, uh, uh, progress. And this ethical progress is very, very specific one because in 1847, uh, which is the same years, Helmholtz wrote a very important, uh, uh, it's also, it was at the end of the pamphlet or treatise on the conservation of, conservation of force, which was, totally from a materialistic view of, of, of nature. So how could he, how could he trust scientists? So why should I not think that scientists would be given the right philosophical, spiritual interpretation and give us really salvation and God and not materialism? Um, well, yeah, you know, I don't know what, Schleiden's um, response to Helmholtz will, would have been. I know that he spends a lot of time in his 
1863 essay attacking Virchow um, as being too um, as being a, a poor philosopher, uh, as, as as having uh, bad logic. Um, but but you know the thing about Helmholtz. So. So my focus in this project is on the generation before that Helmholtz, Dubois, Raymond, Brücke, those guys, um, because they really did transform physiology. Um, but I was, I'm very interested in what seems to me that, I mean, Fierkhoff is really unusual in having been able to keep his position and be a political professor. Um, you know, active in, in, in party politics. And I mean, he had to take a little time off from that because he promised not to at Würzburg when he first got hired there. But, but it is striking to me that the, that the more radical materials like Vogt and uh, Moschott were um, in fact kicked out of, of their positions and and what made their work radical was not only their materialism, but their desire to spread it directly to the masses rather than like having more intermediate gear works in, in the middle. And I think that was um, explicitly in connection with, um, with a political, with an explicit political goal of um, increasing suffrage and increasing the education of people uh, who they hope would be able to vote. And it's very striking to me that uh, when I think of Helmholtz's popular writings later and Du Bois-Raymond's writings, they're very cultural in something of the same way as Schleiden's. That is, they, they point to high culture issues, you know, music, uh, vision, art, poetry, um, and not um, like how to feed the people, um, which is what Molshaw was interested in. And so I wonder if, if they aren't also taking a cue from Schleiden's approach that this is a safer way of, of connecting your message to a larger cultural message. It's just something I've been thinking about uh, lately because, because I do think it's a hard hump to get over, right? You know, that they're not going to a higher, they're not connecting that to a higher spiritual message. But I do think it's also a generational thing. And here's, here's somebody else who I think is um, in a slightly different context. When uh, Darwin publishes Origin of Species, he sends a copy um, to, um, Adam Sedgwick, one of his teachers, uh, who writes him this very sorrowful letter where he says, what I see you doing is separating the science from the moral side of things. And if you do that, then it's not worth anything. Um, that, that severing that connection between the scientific and the ethical and moral uh, vision for what knowledge should be um, is, is, I mean, he just was devastated by that separation. He thought it was a terribly um, dangerous and depressing thing to do. And so I, I think that, that there, I think there's something similar there about this view of, of trying to retain that connection and one of the things that I think happens with popular writing, that one of the other splits that happens between popular and scientific writing in, in the 1850s and later is that it's in the popular realm that those connections, whether it's to, to assert materialism or to assert a connection, but the, the connection between the, um, fact-oriented inductive approach to science and the moral realm 
is drawn. And that what happens is that you get the scientists being able, depending on that to make the, not Schleiden, but other scientists, depending on that to make the case for them, and then making a kind of a narrower kind of connection to culture on the whole, which is this kind of high culture connection. That's a thought that I've been playing around with. Okay, thank you very much. Lynn, for the talk and for the discussion. Thank you for all the participants in the discussion. So uh, we will uh, meet uh, in two weeks, as I mentioned, not in one, because uh, it's a holiday next week, and then we'll hear uh, Kathy Kish uh, with, uh, with us, and uh, on, we'll talk about uh, the chapter from her dissertation. Uh, so have a nice holiday next week. But to, this week we continue with the uh, the general uh, uh, work at the university. And thank you all so much. Thanks thank you. Bye-bye, thanks. Bye-bye.